to those that are watching uh, by live stream. Tonight, it, we're excited to be able to bring our second panel discussion uh, that we've decided to do um, several times um, a month at the church to help people become in touch with the Word of God and to get their questions answered. It's a time where um, of discussion because, as you know, nobody's going to have all of the answers when it comes to the Bible. And we know, of course, the Holy Spirit is our ever-wise teacher. But uh, we have a really excited uh, group that's going to be here to share with you tonight, a little different than the panel last time. Tonight, we're blessed to have Rachel Hermanson. Uh, she's the teacher of our young adult Bible study. So we're glad to have her tonight. Scott Bowlby, who has a lot of background and training in, in the word. And also, of course, our esteemed pastor, Pastor Kenwin, is going to be here with us tonight. And we have our youth pastor, Jerry James. So we have a bunch of questions that you all, yeah, they, they deserve some applause. <laughs> And, and myself, I'm Dr. Kathy Hurley, and I will be um, facilitating tonight. I won't really be part of the discussion, but uh, to kind of uh, keep the uh, questions going. And also, at the end, we're going to open it up for questions that you may have in the audience tonight, that something that you might have always wondered about, about the Bible, uh, something that you just want to hear what other people uh, may say about, so please be prepared for that tonight. And we're also going to be monitoring Facebook tonight to see if we have any questions for those of you that are joining us by live stream. We want you to feel like you're a part of us tonight, too. Uh, so please feel free to go ahead and type your questions in on the Facebook so that uh, you can be part of that. And at that point in time, uh, we have Brother Jesse, who's our minister that's going to be Woo! taking the questions from the floor. He doesn't know that. I'm volunteering him to do we that tonight. <laughs> show up on time. You get advance yeah. notice. <laughs> Just in case you didn't know, we volunteered you for that tonight. Okay. Well, you can do both. So you ask your question, and then you can open it up. Uh, okay. Well, you can tell we have a lot of fun here at our church. We're a small congregation, but, you know, we have good fellowship with each other, don't we? Amen. So it's a wonderful uh, church community. And so, but that being said, we want to open up with some prayer tonight. We know we have some prayer concerns in the church, and we know we have uh, some sadness. We had a, a, a home going, but we want to remember that family tonight. So I'm going to... Uh, open. We're going to open with prayer, and our pastor, Pastor Kenwin, is going to lead the, us in prayer tonight. Dear Lord, we come before you this evening, and we thank you for another opportunity to be in your house with your people, studying your word, Lord, taking questions, and just sharpening each other, Lord. None of us know the answer, Lord, and with all the different misinterpretations and interpretations and different versions of the Bible, God, some of the things get mixed up and confused, Lord, but the most important thing is that we know you and the power of the resurrection, Lord. The most important thing is not to just know about the author of the word, but to know him, Lord, and so we ask that you will come into our hearts right now, our mind, Lord, as we worship and praise you by getting into your word, and we, we ask that you will reveal yourself to us. Lord, we don't have any of the answers, oh God. We just can look to your word and rely on you and depend on you. Thank you for these men and women that have come out this evening to share what they have studied. I pray that the Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit, will bring back to our remembrance what we have studied. I pray that you will guide us tonight. Lord, let somebody's heart and mind be changed to draw closer to you. Lord, I pray for those that are in the audience, those that are watching online, that you will bless them that you'll keep them, Lord, and I pray for those families that are hurting, that you'll comfort them right now by the power of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Well, as I said, we have a list of questions uh, that we're going to be 
going from, and this came from the congregation. And so, as I say, everybody will get a chance to have their questions asked, whether you're here tonight or whether you're uh, there uh, watching us by live stream. So our first question is, from your perspective, why should one study the Old Testament? Pastor Kenwin, do you want to start with that one? Sure, I will start uh, with that one. Um, <coughs> Brother Scott reminded me before the panel, it's from your perspective why we study the Old Testament. So me personally, I love reading the Old Testament. I love the stories. I love reading about Samuel and Samson and just watching the way that God used them in such a uh, mighty way. But um, growing up in church, sometimes we just read the Bible just because um, that's traditionally what we know. But when you're being asked why you read the Old Testament, then it's like you have to sort of come up with an answer. And it's not that you don't have an answer, but you want to give people who are questioning or whatever reason it is about the Old Testament. So um, I like to point my answers back to the text. And um, my perspective and my view is that the, the, uh, the Bible is incomplete without the Old Testament. You can't just read the New Testament and neglect the Old Testament. And I'll try to make it quick because I want the others to share. But uh, I don't think you could just read the New and, and forget about the Old Testament. Um, the New Testament was never given to replace the Old Testament. They go hand in hand. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 14 and 19 talks about the curse on humanity because of sin. And that's found in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, in Revelation 22, it completes the story by recording how God, through the redemptive work of Jesus, has removed the curse. So there's, you got to understand where the curse came from, which is the, in the beginning, Adam and Eve. You don't just go to salvation and don't understand how we ended up in sin. And um, the Old Testament instructs believers in concerning the person of, and the work of Jesus Christ. Um, it talks about, the, you know, in Luke, the death, the resurrection. If you want to know Jesus, the Lamb of God, you cannot neglect the prophecies that are found um, in the Old Testament. Also, all of Scripture is God-breathed, uh, and that's found in 2 Timothy 3 and 16. It's all profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training, not just the New Testament, the Old Testament as well, all of it. And uh, if Christians neglect to study the Old Testament, then you won't be as proficient in your service to the Lord because um, you won't have a, a thorough knowledge of the application of the entire Bible. So I'll just leave it at that. And for me, it's just exciting when I read about Sarah and Abraham in her old age, what God has done, and just watching the work of the Lord in the beginning. And you read in Genesis, he created, he separated the dry land from the waters. Adam and Eve, they were in the garden. They were told not, you know, not to partake of the fruit. The serpent came, lied to him. The serpent was cursed. There's pain in childbearing. And you walk through all these things, Samson and, and David and Samuel and Jesse, it's just amazing watching Sarah in her old age, reading through the book of Daniel. I mean, it's just, there's no movie that is ex as exciting as reading through the Old Testament. I mean, it's just a thrill. I was reading just, you know, about Abraham and Sarah and, and how, uh, you know, the angel of the Lord came and, and, and talk, talked to them and, and laughed and all the promises that are found in the Word of God. And then watching how in the New Testament, Jesus comes and it's the Spirit of God. It's, you know, we'll talk about the Trinity. And it's the Word of God in flesh. You know, the things we read about and you heard God's voice audibly like Samuel did. Now Jesus is here on earth. And they crucified him. And he died to, and, and, and shed his blood because that was the only way to reverse the curse from Je uh, Genesis. But I'll, I'll let somebody else talk <laughs> because I'll just thank go you, on. Pastor. But uh, thank you. And I like the picture that you presented of that. It's beautiful, really. Testament uh, uh, prophesied about Messiah. And that's a beautiful picture. Uh, Sister Rachel, do you have anything you'd like to uh, share or add to that? Yes. Uh, at first, I was going to talk about the Old Testament being one of the strongest evidences for the Bible with the prophecies of Jesus in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, but I don't need that evidence. I've got <laughs> enough evidence in my book. So, from my perspective, 
it's really beautiful to see the need that we have for Jesus, which we get from reading the Old Testament. We see time and time again how humanity has sold their birthright. Adam and Eve, by eating of the fruit, we had we had l- quite literally Esau selling his birthright to Jacob, and that's a picture of what we do every time. Humanity chooses to sin, and the natural consequence for that is death. But we have a kinsman redeemer, which is Jesus, and that is so beautiful. And if you have someone coming up saying to you, I just paid your parking ticket. I saw you run that red light. You're good. (laughs) And you said, I didn't drive yesterday. It wouldn't make much sense. You need to know where you have failed in order to understand that full forgiveness and that debt that's been paid. Yeah, uh, both of you. I, I love both of you guys' answers. Um, I, I love the old stories. I, I love to just enjoy them. And I also, I, you know, the Jesus in the Bible is, is, is an amazing thing. And, and, and learning, learning how far we have fallen is an amazing thing. So for me, what inspires me to study the Old Testament is that's the context in which the people in that we read about in the New Testament understood the entire Bible. So when Jesus is preaching scripture and when Jesus is, is mentioning things, they, having studied the Bible every year, they go through the, through the, uh, the entire Old Testament, they, they're very fam- intimately familiar with it. You know, Jesus you know, was teaching, uh, Jesus was teaching on the cross. He, he mentioned Psalm 22. He taught, he, you know, he used a, a rabbi trick. He, he said, you know, you know, you're exactly. Oh, yeah. Lord, 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 Thank you, because I, yeah. I could not. Refer, I could not remember. <laughs> but yes, a, and that would be a a a, a, um, a what a, a memnonic trick. But you would uh, for your students to learn, you would say the first few phrases or few first few words uh, of a passage, so that your students know what you're talking about. And uh, so the context, they you know the people that are listening to to Jesus preach. They are very intimate with the Old Testament, and, 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 uh, and so finding those things brings a broader meaning to the New Testament for me because I'm lear- learning along the same paths as what they do. So I wanted to give an example. Um, in the book of Luke in chapter 4, um, starting at uh, probably about verse 16, anyway, um, Jesus is in, his, is in his hometown of Nazareth. And um, he's going to do the uh, the daily reading uh, uh, for that day in the synagogue, right? So he g- goes up and he and he unrolls and he's given th- you know this is they do the same reading on the same day each year. So I mean th- it's not like this was chance. Jesus knew he was going to be reading this scripture that day, so he gets up there and I got you pulled up here. Starting at verse eighteen, he starts reading. He says. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then it does, it takes a trick. It says he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Now, if we don't know the Old Testament, we don't see anything wrong with that. If you do know the Old Testament, like these people knew the Old Testament that, w- that he was reading to, they'd know he stopped before that phrase was do- before that passage was done. He stopped on a comma. And then he declared to them, this day, th- this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus is, is telling them that that part I- is covered, and that's why he stopped on the comma, because the rest of that passage, which is Isaiah 61, uh, talks about the day of the Lord. Uh, that's that's at the end. So we're in this comma that has been going on for 2,000 years. And the people then knew that. They knew that, wait, there's, there's something special going on here. A- and we don't catch it because we, d- we aren't intimately familiar with Isaiah li- like the people that, w- you know, that were expecting to hear the entire passage of Isaiah that day. We don't catch that wait a minute, what's going on here? Why did he stop? Why did he sit down? What's going on? That, you know, and revelations like that is what excites me. It, 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 you know, to, to find th- those things and realize that an intimate knowledge of the Old Testament 
is almost required to really understand everything Jesus was teaching during the New Testament. So that's my answer. Uh, can I piggyback on that? And it's funny because I feel the same way about the Old Testament. I mean, it's really, they're so interlinked. Without a full knowledge of the New Testament, you can't fully understand, see everything, the complete depth that's in the Old Testament. I mean, like the story of Isaac, you go, uh, why did <laughs> the Lord tell Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? This doesn't quite make sense. Now, it makes sense later. He's looking forward to Christ. That whole that whole scenario, that whole scene is just a picture of Christ. And that's another thing that excites me about the Old Testament is you see Christ just popping up all over the place. It's amazing. him to pull out a Pura scroll right then. <laughs> I got so excited. But but then you can kind of see how when somebody puts it all together for a Jewish person, they really come to see Messiah. They see Yeshua uh, because they've been talking about him, as you mentioned. Every week the Torah is a different scripture in the Torah, but it's the same 52 weeks out of the year. And so that's why they had such an intimate knowledge. But thanks for that. It was so exciting. Pastor Jerry, do you have anything to add to that? What they said? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so we've been teaching the youth about deception and deceit um, in this world. You know, they have, I always tell them, this is probably the most deceitful thing you'll ever own. Actually, my, my wife's picture popped up. That's not her. She's not that. <laughs> but the kids called me on it. Um, there's a lot of mistruths in the world. If you take away the Old Testament and you just start with the New Testament with Jesus dying for our sins, okay, but it doesn't explain Adam and Eve. And if you talk about it from being saved, if you don't have the Old Testament, you really don't understand why Jesus had to die for our sins. And so if you have somebody that is... It, I'll just be honest. If I start a if I start a false religion and I just start with the New Testament, it's easy. I just tell you that well, Jesus died for your sins. For what what are your sins? Well, don't worry about that. We'll we'll get to that later, you know. And then you just start down that path of deception. So, understanding the Old Testament with Adam and Eve, you have to have that history of why Jesus died for us. So it's you know, talking from a level of salvation. Yes, all the stories are great and, and they're awesome to read. Um, but really, bottom line is you have to understand Adam and Eve and why Jesus died for us. So disregarding the Old Testament or not, you know, throwing that out. And I'm not saying anybody is. I'm not saying that. But you have to be careful that people want to deceive. I was going to add, if it's all right. Uh, and I love the, the text you brought up with, with Jesus uh, quoting what he did, you know, quoting. I think it was Joel, Prophet Joel, when he uh, said. Isaiah 61, uh, where I've anointed you to preach the gospel and all that. And, um, you know, it's like uh, if Jesus quoted that, then, then uh, if you don't know the Old Testament, what would, how would you know what he was even talking about? And um, as believers, we are called to make disciples, not the pastor or the preacher, but Christians, you know, we go out and we win other Christians. And when you're evangelizing to people, and if I meet before he became Pastor Jerry, just Jerry on the street, and I said, you know, you need salvation, and and he'll say, well, this is, you know, why do I need salvation? You know, going to the Old Testament, you can help somebody understand why they need salvation. When you go and you try to win a lost soul, they don't think they're lost. They don't believe they're lost. They don't see the reason of why do you, does does God need to save me, you know, and that, that helps, you know, just sort of putting it in a practical understanding. It helps you with event making uh, disciples. But I also wanted to read the book of John chapter 8 and verse 51, which says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man, this is Jesus talking, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. And sometimes I use this when I do funerals. He said, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. And when he said this, the Jews uh, said unto him, now we know that you have a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. And then they asked him, are you greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? 
who makest you thyself? And Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is our, your God. Yet ye have not known him. And this sounds like Trinitarian language because I know we got to get into that a little bit. Uh, he says, Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him. And keep us saying, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and, it, and he was glad. So if you don't know what the Old Testament says, that if you don't know who Abraham is, that would make no sense to you. And it just, it just makes it so much better when you read the New Testament, tying it in with the Old. I believe Gio back there had his hands up, Ms. Dr. Kath. Yes. Okay. We appreciate Gio. Um, I I accepted every everyone's um, answers. I just um, just add one more thing. If if I watch a movie, if I um, watch a ha from the half part, <laughs> so that's the thing. So New Testament. Amen. So that's the only thing. <laughs> yeah. So you d you didn't get the um, you know the first part. Right. You should know the first part. You need to start from the scratch. So that's it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, they say the Old Testament is the New Testament revealed in a nutshell. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, and, and like Pastor said, this is a good segue to the next question. The next question is about can you explain the concept of the Trinity, um, which we know sometimes is controversial a little bit, uh, and it's one that you as a believer will probably have to answer at some point in time. So maybe a good one to take some notes on because uh, the fact that it's really not in the Bible per se, it is, but the, con the word Trinity isn't exactly there. So with that in mind, I know this is one uh, that Brother Scott has a lot of background in. Um, I'd like to hear your view on that. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, so, yeah, the, the concept of the Trinity is all through the Old and New Testament. Um, it, the word isn't, but the word typewriter isn't in, in there either. But, yeah, I mean... There, there's lots of words that aren't that aren't in the scripture, but um, the word dinosaur isn't in the scripture. Um, they use the word dragon instead. Um, but the concept you can find all through. Um, Pastor Kenwin just mentioned uh, a good one right there, but we find all the all the time where where they talk about, you know, Jesus talks about the Father and 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 Jesus talks about the Spirit and and. He's not a ventriloquist, you know, and a lot of times I think what, you know, I think most of us as Christians understand that, the, that there's a good, solid teaching of the Trinity in the Bible. I think what we get lost on is trying to describe that to other people. Um, I mean, I, I'm w I'd be willing to follow up with proof, you know, biblical proof of the, of the Trinity in the Bible. I'm sure others on here will have that, though. I'd like to just point out that a lot of times people try to come up with their own little you know, concept of the Trinity, and they all, it always fails. I, every single way to describe the Trinity will break down and fail, and there's a reason for that. It's because you cannot compare God with any created thing, nothing. Y y you know, I mean even, e even imaginary items, you can't, you can't compare God with them. Um, so, I have an analogy that I try to use, but it still breaks down. Um, you, you'll hear people, they, they're like, oh, God is like the egg with the shell and the yolk and the white. And that makes no sense. That's called partialism. Um, you can't have an egg without a shell. You can't have an egg without a yolk. You can't have an egg with, you know, so this partialism, it breaks down when you take one piece away. That's, the God is not like that. God is, each, each person of God is complete. So, First of all, let's let's just do a, a broad definition. The Trinity is one being, God, comprised of three co-equal, co-eternal persons. And it's very important that we understand that they are co-equal and co-eternal. One did not come before the other, right? And they are individual persons. And what happens is is when you... When those things fail, um, let's say you 
say it, it's three beings, three gods. Well, then you have, that's polytheism. That's, you know, uh, what a lot of other religions accuse us of, of being, of uh, being polyistic, poly polytheist. Uh, Muslims will, will um, uh, oftentimes say that Christians are polytheists because we believe in three gods. Well, we don't believe in three gods. We believe in one god that is comprised of three persons. And it's, you know, that's a concept that's hard to wrap your head around, but that's what we believe. So, um, but uh, on the other side, if you, if you uh, say don't believe in the co-equal, co-eternal part, then, th then you're, that's a progression of gods. That's a prog progression of God. Um, and so, therefore, one will be superior to another, and that's totally not what we, we believe. We believe they're co-equal, co-eternal. Um, and if you, uh, if you don't believe in the three persons, you just believe it's one God that's co-equal, well, it's just one God, then you're believing in what's called modalism, and that's where God becomes the Son who becomes the Holy Spirit and the switcheroo back and forth thing. And that's when you get people saying, is, is, was Jesus a ventriloquist? Was he speaking to himself You know, when he was baptized and at the Mount of Transfiguration and all these other times? Th th those aren't those don't work so um that's the important thing is, is keeping those in mind um i don't even know if i'm gonna bother doing my analogy do, do, should i bother Cause, all right i have an analogy and, and, and it breaks down us. i think you need to now it breaks down for a different reason uh it breaks down because we as human beings cannot think of infallible people because we are all fallible Here's my, my analogy. My analogy is a corporation. The corporation called God has three CEOs named the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each one of them are co have coexisted and, co uh, and have eternally existed as that corporation. And that's, you know, and one chooses to sit in the high tower and make the, 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 you know, the big decisions. One chooses to be the public face of, of, of the corporation, and one chooses to work behind the scenes and get everything done. But they're all equally powerful in the corporation. They all have all decision-making properties, and they never disagree. Now, that's kind of cool. It, it is sort of, you know, if you know about corporate structure, it feasibly could work. But we're people. We know that's never going to happen. You're never going to have three people that always agree. You're never going to have three people that don't try to um, become superior to one another, or, or, or you know. And so it, it breaks down because of human nature. But at least I, have, I don't think it's modalism or partialism. So <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the only the only thing I have for it. But anyway, that's that's enough on that. But uh, I'll turn it over to some of you other guys to, for proof of the of the Trinity in the Bible. You want to? Go for that. Proof, proof of the Trinity? Yeah. Well, so I, you were talking about analogy. One of the things, um, you know, Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father. Okay, so the two are one. But then at the same sense, Jesus says, only the Father in heaven knows the day nor the hour. So kind of showing, yeah, for the second coming, so kind of shows kind of a, a three, and at the same time showing all at one. It's, I mean, who are we as humans to try to explain, you know, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost? Um, we used to have, um, you know, in, in the military, we had a 20th Air Force commander and a Task Force 214 commander. It was the same person. So it's almost like, you know, Jerry, I'm a husband, I'm a father, um, I'm a brother type thing. But yet, I can't be all those things all the time, okay? God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at every time. And so just think of yourself as being three separate intent entities, but at the same time, you're one, but you just don't have that skill set of being omni omnipresent. You are, but that's, that's an example of modalism. I, you I know. It's yeah, you're I not going to get this right. Right, yeah. <laughs> I, but I I'm like not going to get it right. No, that, that's fine. I would like to um, rebut, not rebut, I would like to point out, you know, the I and the Father are one. That's, that's, they're, they're one as in they're of one mind. They, they, they uh, you know, it, it talks about how they always agree. That's what, where, I, you know, I and the Father are one. 
Um, and the fact that the father knows something th that the son doesn't know, to me, that reads that they both agree that the father should know it and the son shouldn't. You know, uh, it, that's they're still co-equal, co-eternal. They've just made that decision that one will know and one will not. You know, uh, it's not that Jesus couldn't know. It's that he chose not to. And, you know, and, and that's uh, that shows the oneness of them, that they that they have decided that. And, that, and that's what they did. And um, so, uh, you know, the, that's a oneness that we should strive for, you know, being face to face, intimate with one another. It talks about that in. Um, First Corinthians 13, maybe. Now we see through the mirror darkly, darkly. and and then um, but in heaven we will see one another face to face. It talks about the intimate knowledge and, you know, that, that, that alludes to the to the, the to the the relationship between father and son. Right. Um, it, the, it's a very, very you know, the face to face thing is a very intimate like, you know, you, you don't you can't hide. You have no secrets when you're face to face with somebody. It's it's it, it, it's. And that's the way the father and the son are one. The, you know, the proston peon, you know, yeah. in, in John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, Jesse. I am loving this. This is so great. I'm so excited. I could hardly sit still. Um, I just wanted to point out that when Jesus was being baptized, that was the one moment where there were all three present. Jesus, the son, and the Holy Spirit descended as a dove, and then God the Father is speaking, saying, this is my beloved son who am I well pleased. Amen to that. I just wanted to throw that right. in there. Anyway, I'm loving you guys. You guys are awesome. There's also, though, where we get, and I'm surprised nobody has said it yet, the Hebrew plural noun of Elohim. They were all present at the creation of the, of the world. Uh, there in Genesis 126, let us make man in our own image. So that's another time where they were all together. Um, Sister Rachel, have you got something to add? I am eager to share. <laughs> I know you are. I so can tell. <laughs> I'm going to say we can't understand the Trinity completely. Right. But that doesn't make it not true. Right. Can anyone imagine the new color? No, but we can all see it. Well, most people can. <laughs> but that doesn't mean it's not true just because you can't understand it. Because we are limited, but God is not. And I have an analogy. I'm going to try to share it. And it is imperfect. <laughs> it does <laughs> fail, but for, but for a different reason than some other uh, illustrations. So you may not be able to see this, but I've got uh, a dot. I'll show you to you all first. I got a dot, a rectangle, and then a, a slimmer rectangle. Now, if I told you this was all the same thing, can anyone imagine how that could be? This is all the same. Well, I'll show you. So that's all one object interacting with this on, on different sides. You, you can lay it sideways, you can lay it flat, or as a point. And that's just to illustrate that we live in three spatial dimensions. So we can't comprehend anything outside of that. We can try, but it kind of, you really can't. <laughs> so God exists outside of time and he exists outside of space and let me just share some scripture to state that we have uh second peter three and eight but beloved do not forget that this one thing that with the lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day continuing on isaiah 57 and 15 for thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity he inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in a high and holy place. That, that's the relevant part. And we've got him uh, in Psalm 90 and 2, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So God is not limited by time. That is how he can see all things and know all things. He created time in the beginning. And he's not limited by space. We have 1 Kings 8 and 27. But will God indeed, indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. He cannot be contained. And we have Jeremiah 23, 24. Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? 
So, no, we cannot comprehend the entire understanding of the Trinity. We have to just understand that there are things we cannot know and cannot understand. But we have to trust in the Lord that what he says is true. Thank you for that. Yes. He is triune as we are triune. And th these concepts further enrich us. And I agree with that. And that, that is just so wonderful. Now we see through a, a glass dimly. Uh, but then we'll, we'll see face to face. Then we'll be known as we're known. And uh, that is so true. I think that kind of talks about Rachel's uh, dimension. I think we will enjoy this many dimensions as, as uh, Jesus does at that point. And colors. Yeah, we'll and be seeing, you, you know, can see you can smell colors fails. and, you know. In, colors. in yeah. the illustration <laughs> is because this is all parts of one object, but Jesus is not part of God. Jesus is, he is God. Yeah. And and uh, I read um, where it says Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. Now, understand this, that firstborn to us, there's not any difference between really firstborn and secondborn except for age. But firstborn culturally back then in, in Hebrew culture was they had the right over, over the others and they had the inheritance right. So when Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, it doesn't mean he was created first. It means he is ruler over all creation. Sure. I, I have a picture here, and I wish I would have sent it to you Rick to pull it up. I figured you had a picture there. Yeah, but um, it basically says the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Right. So if you can sort of picture in your head that, and yeah, I, I'm, I apologize. I, I, sh I should have sent that. Three CEOs, they have different missions or different tasks. Right. But they, they're still CEOs, in other words, or amen. still part of that cell phone. So <laughs> the Trinity, that that amen. Was saying. The, uh, thr the, the Trinity, three equally divine persons, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the same s in substance and essence, just like Brother Scott mentioned. Uh, in Christian doctrine, the unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three persons in one Godhead. Three distinct, different, but one Godhead. And um, the Bible speaks of the Father as God in Philippians 1, 2. It speaks of Jesus as God in Titus 2 and 13. And then it speaks uh, of the Holy Spirit as God in Acts chapter 5, verse 3 to 4. So are these just different ways of looking at, at God or simply ways of referring to three different roles that God plays? Um, for example, the Father sent the Son into the world in John 3.16. He cannot be the same person as the Son because the Father sent the Son. Amen. I don't want to use <laughs> human language because we'll get in trouble. But the Father sent the Son. Uh, likewise, the Son returned to the Father in John chapter 16 and verse 10. And then the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit into the world in John 14 and Acts Chapter 2, therefore, the Holy Spirit must be distinct from the Father and the Son. And, and uh, everybody on the panel so far has, has basically already said that. And um, I had Miss Anna's analogy in, in my notes with the baptism of Jesus where he's in, uh, being baptized, speaking from heaven, the Father, and the Spirit descending from heaven in the form of a dove as Jesus comes out of the water in the book of Mark and John. Um, Jesus is God, and at the same time, he was with God, thereby indicating that Jesus is a distinct person from God, the Father. And um, there's a close unity between them all. The Holy Spirit is also different from the Father and the Son. But with all that being said, there's still only one God. So the scripture is clear that there is only one God. He says that there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There's none besides me and to me and be saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is no other and that's Isaiah 45 uh, it's Exodus 15 Deuteronomy 4 and 1 Samuel 2 1 Kings and so the application is that um, it's three different people three different persons with three different roles but one Godhead and you can go really deep into that about the purpose of all three, um, their functions, but this is just a basic 
description of it. Have you guys ever seen that movie called The Shack? I'm sorry, can you? Have you ever seen that movie called The Shack? I haven't seen it, but it's actually, I'm in. I'm movie. reading the book right now. Yeah, that movie. <laughs> if you guys haven't seen that movie, watch it. It's a powerful movie, and, and it has a perfect description. I don't want to say perfect, but it has a really nice layout of the Trinity, of their functions in that movie. It's really. You have, have you seen it, Rachel? It's an old movie, but it's really powerful. It's called The Shack. You S reading the book? A C K. Yes. Okay. I'm it's reading a the book. Really right now. good, powerful Christian movie. So, yeah. with that said, I want to ask. You uh, Bible scholars up there. Uh, <laughs> 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 nice to meet you. But so it's safe to say, explaining the Trinity in a brief nutshell to someone, we will say uh, they have one. They are one, right? But with different functions. And if go ahead. Three who's and a what? Right. <laughs> three no. Three who's and a what? With Father, right. Son, Holy Ghost. Are the three and if they ask, what well, is God? what are their functions? How can we, what's the best, what's a good effective way to break that down in them? So, you know, they can at least grasp it. So, would we say the Holy Spirit, the convictor, uh, the revealer of truth, Christ, the bridge to God and God, you know, because as you guys said, no one knows when Christ returns. No one knows, not even the angels, right? So we see God is yeah. the guy <laughs> in heaven. So right. I'm just asking you guys feedback. What's a good way for us to break it down? Uh, well, I don't want to say to an unbeliever, but, you know, just to, if, to the knowledge sake of it for us to, you know, know what we're talking about and stuff like that. If it was that easy, it wouldn't have been a question. <laughs> 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 just in a brief. Like, like you mentioned, the Father is in heaven right now. Uh, mm -hmm. when I try to explain to young children. And the Son is seated to his right side right now, and the Holy Spirit is seated above. And, and he comes and dwells in our heart um, when we accept Christ. And then we're also sealed by the Holy Spirit. But that gets us into another question that we're going to talk about. Um, it's hard. <laughs> I love the, f the simple fact that the Father sent the Son to die for our sins. The Son was crucified, but he resurrected. So the Father is God in heaven, and he sent the Son, who is also God. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. And then he said, I go to prepare a place for you, but I'm sending to you the Comforter. All three of them are God, but three totally, and you said the Comforter, you know. Yeah, I was you were asking um, uh, like a single word for, for each, I, I, you know, the Father. Um, Jesus would be the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit would be the Comforter. Um, and uh, the, the Father is, you know, the creator of all things. Jesus is the Redeemer of all things, and, and the Holy Spirit is, is the Comforter who, you know, hel helps us through until we're able to rejoin with the Father and the Son. Yeah, uh, that would be my short, quick of the, of the three there. as our Savior without our ever wise teacher, the Holy Ghost. Um, yeah. So I hope that's uh, helpful yeah. for, for everybody in our quick time yeah. to and explain. Those that are in the audience and watching online, at the next panel, Pastor Jesse will be on the panel. Yeah. And <laughs> Pastor Anna in the you back will be on the panel on as well. We volunteered you for all so sorts of stuff. I'm excited Can to hear from them volunteer? as well. <laughs> <laughs> Bring your seat on up. You just joined. <laughs> Now, the next question talks about if when we get to heaven, um, will we know each other as we are on earth? Now, our first panel discussion, we got into this a little bit, um, but I think that was like one of the last questions, so we, we brought that back to maybe clarify a little bit tonight. Um, will we know each other as we, we know on earth? Yeah, I, I, I'll I start with my notes because questions like these, I mean, it's sometimes you don't think about it, you know, and, and, and you start talking about Jesus and people have all these questions. And they're great questions because I think we do need to have somewhat of an, an answer 
but uh, I serve God for who he is, and I love him. I love what he's done on the cross. But then, you know, people want answers, and, and, and uh, we look to the word of God to try to find those answers. Um, I just pulled a few things out of the word, um, and to me, I'll be honest, these aren't uh, hard answers to the question. It's just, you know, you think about it and ask maybe God to reveal it to you. But uh, I'm, I can't honestly say that I'm giving you the answer to this question. I'm pulling out from Scripture what I believe will help you in maybe making your own conclusion. But um, Moses and Eli- Elijah, when the, glory, when, when the glory of Jesus was revealed to them in Matthew 17 in the transfiguration, we are told that Moses and Elijah appeared to them and were, was talking with him. Um, this is awesome because Moses and Elijah appeared. They did not have the resurrection body. There were souls made visible as the angels were made visible to the shepherds. And as their souls under the altar were made visible to John in Revelation 6, 9. Also, they were waiting to be clothed with the resurrection body. Moses and Elijah were known. Okay. They were recognizable and they were able to engage in conversation. This tells us a lot about the conscious joy of fellowship that believers share immediately after the death in the presence of the Lord. Also, if you remember David, uh, who the son that died in infancy, which... You know, we don't really, I guess, talk about that a whole lot. But when the little boy died, David said, I will go to him. It's, it's not an answer per se. I mean, that's not like yes or no. But Second Samuel 12 and 23, he says, I'll go to him. When uh, David knew that he would see his son again in the presence of the Lord and knowing that he would be reunited with the son he loved, uh, brought him comfort in his bereavement. We have Abraham, Isaac. And Jacob, and I got a few of these, so I'll I'll probably just make it short so other people can share. Uh, Matthew 8, the Lord said, many will come from the east um, and the west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 8. Abraham was the father of Isaac and the grandfather of Jacob, and in the heaven he enjoys the company of his son and his grandson, while Jacob enjoys the company of his father and his grandfather. Uh, We have Jesus and the disciples in the book of Matthew chapter 26. Uh, Jesus told his disciples, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new, in a new way in my Father's kingdom with you. The eleven who shared the last supper with Jesus on earth will eat and drink with him in heaven. Peter, James, and John and the others will be named and known in heaven as clearly as they were named and known. The The reunion of believing loved ones. When Paul writes to believers who grieve the loss of loved one, and I like to use this one at funerals as well, in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, he says, We who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Again, it's not saying, you know, we will, you know, uh, know them, but we'll be caught up together. Them refers to them to believing loved ones who are <laughs> now in the presence of the Lord. A wife who grieves the loss of her uh, believing husband has the comfort of knowing that when the Lord comes, she will meet her husband again, like uh, the Greens. Amen. <coughs> Son and sons and daughters who grieve the loss of a believing father or mother can find comfort in the prospect of this happy reunion when we will be reunited with those who have gone before us into the presence of the Lord. I don't really have anything to add to that. I just think that, well, honestly, I think the question is, do you recognize people when you get to heaven? Yes. And I think the real question that wasn't asked is, will you recognize people who aren't there? So, right, it's, you know, if I get to heaven and my brother's not there, my sister, will I recognize that? Honestly, I I tell the kids, it's like, your first trip to Disney World, uh, you're so excited, you know, you remember who's there. You don't remember who wasn't there. And I think when you get to heaven, uh, it's going to be, significantly better in Disney World, I'll guarantee you that. And I just think it'll be like, Pastor Kenwin, did you see that? I'm not going to remember who isn't there. I mean, Scott, did you see this? So I think the the joy and the peace and just God's presence when we get to heaven, that we will recognize people, um, but there's no pain, there's no sorrow. So I don't think we're going to recognize people who aren't there. Well, um, I don't have 
much. I read through some scripture, but none of it really convinced me either way because it doesn't really talk on the issue too much. I mean, uh, we have Mark 12 and 24 that talks about Jesus uh, when he talks about the dead rising, uh, when he's responding to, it was either the Pharisees or Sadducees. But anyway, he says, when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Instead, they will be like the angels in heaven. Okay, but then what's, what are the angels in heaven like? I mean, we can't really, we, we just have to turn to the scripture and try our best to kind of understand. But it's not, I don't think it's really given to us because w we know when we get to heaven, there will be not a tear and there will be no sadness. Maybe if we focused on it, we would focus on the wrong things and really we're just supposed to focus on being with God. Um, I also saw in Revelation 21 and 12, we have the name of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel on the gates uh, that maybe imply that we know some people, maybe the tribes of Israel, but I really couldn't find something to convince me either way. to following the scriptures. Yes, and, and following it and, and being open to what the Holy Spirit's leading you to and that's that's how we learn. And um, uh, if there's something else that you see revealed, I know he's going to reveal it to you. So that that is a perfect example of how we all learn. Uh, Stephen, I guess Scott, are we going to come to you? Yeah, I, I do. I, I think that we need to differentiate between um, knowing each other and knowing each other's physical presence. Um, because I think that the Bible gives us pretty good examples that um, through Jesus that we may not know each other physically, like we may we might we may not not recognize each other. When when Jesus you know came rose from the dead, Mary didn't recognize him in the garden you know in, in the uh, outside the tomb until he spoke, until until she interacted with his presence. You know, not his physical presence, but you know you know his his soul, his spirit. Then she knew him, um, as they're uh, in Acts chapter seven when they're going on down the the the, um, the road to Emmaus, right? Yeah, and uh, none of them none of them knew Jesus. Uh, their eyes were shielded from that fact until he broke bread with them, and and he and uh, I'm assuming he said a blessing or, or you know, uh, some say that they maybe they saw the scars in his arms, but I I think that it was the act of giving a blessing and, and worshiping and, and in fellowship together that allowed them to recognize, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> but um, I was going to go somewhere with that. Oh, my goodness. But, yeah, um, we will know each other I in heaven. I just don't think that we may, we may, not, we may not recognize each other's physical bodies. Th this body I is going to, you know, fall away. We're going to get new bodies, the Bible says. And, um, but our, so our minds and our, and our souls – they don't ever sleep. The Bible says nothing about our soul ever sleeping. Um, our it says our bodies will, you know, and, 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 you know, our bodies will rest. Well, what do we do when we rest now? Our body lays still, but our mind keeps going. Our spirit keeps going. So that's the same way I think it'll be in heaven. Is you know we'll have this in interim period where we don't have a body in, until the resurrection, you know, until the rapture, and um, but we'll still be. We will still exist. So we may have a hard time figuring out who's who. I, it, it could be, but I think it'll be a less hard for those that we have an intimate relationship with because we'll already have the beginnings of that intimate relationship that we'll all have as the bride of Christ in heaven. So uh, that's my answer. I, I think that the body part is not really all that important. It doesn't really matter to me what my body looks like. I, I know that people will know me for my spirit and for my, for my soul in heaven. Well, I really like the differing answers that we had uh, tonight on this question. Um, Pastor um, brought up the fact of, uh, of Eliza, Moses and Eliza, they were recognizable. We know that Abraham and Lazarus in the Bible, Luke 16, 19 through 31, um, we know that they were recognizable, and Pastor spoke briefly about that. 
uh, and then as Scott is saying, some people didn't recognize Jesus, some people did. Um, he came back, you know, that's a glorified body, he came back, and so, uh, I mean, maybe it's a simple fact that everybody else didn't have a glorified body, but maybe we'll recognize everybody when we have one. This is um, uh, more to come for us all when we get to glory on that one. And, and I like what Sister Rachel had to say, too. Um, so it's, a, it's interesting. Um, so some people, it seemed like, recognize people, and, and we know that's very recognizable to one another in heaven, but, but when they're here with a glorified body walking amongst them, um, obviously there's a difference between our fleshly body and our glorified body. Um, I say, viva la difference. I can't wait to get a glorified body. <laughs> yeah. Amen. As you were talking, Dr. Kat, this came to my mind from um, the book of Matthew, chapter 22. Um, and verse, I'll start at verse 23. Matthew, Matthew 22 and verse 23. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and they asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up his seed unto his brother. We were talking about all the New Testament. That's probably part of the Levitical from the old. So that, you know, that there again, you got to know what's going on. But 25 says, now there were with us seven brethren, and the first when he had married, sorry about the <laughs> King Jim, by the way. It's a love right marriage. Yeah. <laughs> Left, right, married. Sorry about the Old Testament and all, but uh, the King James, sorry. Um, there was with us seven brothers, and the first, when he had married a wife, this, this, uh, deceased and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third un unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. And in verse 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err not knowing in the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead but of the living. And of course, when they heard these things, they were marveled. And there again, it doesn't give you an answer of, will you know who these people are? But it's a guide as to helping you come with your conclusion. I'm going to ask if the panel, they all respond to we that. Got, we got a question from Scott. I think on Luke 16th chapter, 19 through 31. Right. That's about Abraham and Lazarus. Now, if they're not recognizable, <coughs> how did the rich man recognize I, uh, Lazarus? How did he recognize Father a Abraham? Yeah. I believe that we're going to be able to recognize different people. But a lot of the things that's in our mind right now are going to be different up there in the other world. Well, as for that specific example, I would say we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. A lot of what's talked about in heaven is the, the current heaven. We're going to get a new Jerusalem. That's what we'll all be a part of. But I was thinking, um, let me pull up my other scripture here in 1 Samuel 16 and 7. For the Lord sees not as man sees, but ma man looks on the outward appearance. But the Lord looks on the heart. So right now we look on the outward appearance. But when we get our new body, who's to say that isn't just our heart? And then that is revealed. So maybe we'll know not just the people we knew on earth, but we'll be able to know everybody. Because we'll may maybe we'll see each other as God sees us on the heart. That's a beautiful thought. And that ties right back into the, you know, the, the, the first Corinthians 13 we mentioned earlier. We, then we will see as he sees, right? right? To be so, known as he knows. right. So, yeah, I, I I totally agree with that. So that's a great great one right there. Um, I wanted to say, uh, as far as yeah, um, um, Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, which um, that is 
it's a controversial thing, but the, they s it may not be the same heaven that we're thinking of now. Uh, that, that's not only is it pre, you know, the second coming of Jesus, it's also prior to the resurrection and, and the raising of the saints. So there's there, there's a lot to be said that that may not be the 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 existence even now as far as what heaven is. Um, but I did want to mention that when people, you know, ask, well, why could Lazarus not see the rich man? I think it's because um, wherever Lazarus was, he was in a bright light. He was w he was in the presence of, of the Lord. And if, you, if you've ever been in a, in a very, very bright room, try to look outside into the darkness and recognize anybody. You can't. You can't see out there. You, it's just it's just dark. But when you're out in the darkness, you can look into that well lit room. So it's kind of a neat it's a neat picture of, you know, uh, of the chasm between those in the outer darkness and those who aren't. Better question. Okay. Why are we talking about hell? This question is, so we know that the Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first, right? Yeah. Um, and then and the Bible also says it is absent from his body is to be present with God. Right. So when let's say we die now, where are we going? Are we going in a Abraham's bosom? Are we going in, in the presence of the Lord? Are we going, what does it really mean when it says <laughs> the dead in Christ shall rise first? So um, you said um, you know, we when we die, uh, we go into the Abraham's bosom or, and one more thing, uh, you know, the second uh, thief on the cross, he said, um, you know, you will be in paradise with me today. The, the, that paradise time comes at that only that time. So Jesus Christ said, you will be in paradise today, like that. I mean, I'm not quoting the exact scripture. It's so the, with yeah. paradise. So uh, when Jesus Christ died, all the dead in Christ, that time a lot of people get resurrected. You know that, you know, Jesus Christ died time. You know, the scripture said a lot of people from the, uh, I mean, the, the places were resurrected, a lot of play, a lot of people walked uh, around. See, yeah. So those things little confused. So that's my question. So so let's break this down, I guess, a little bit. If um, I'm gonna take the first part first. So if we die tonight, um, where would we go from? Scott, why don't you <laughs> Brother Scott said he'll take it, but since oh. you <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> I know he's itching. Uh, it's tough. It really is. It really is tough. And um, I know the word of God says that this mortal body will put on immortality. And he says the dead in Christ will rise. We know all those things happen. But to say when, Scott says he knows when. Okay, Scott <laughs> has an answer to that. <laughs> I don't know what Scott says. <laughs> don't forget where we are now, but the okay. difference between, is there a difference between that and paradise, like Brother Gio said? All right, well, um, first of all, let's, let's keep in mind that you, um, let's, let's use a little bit of science. Um, Einstein said that, if, that you cannot separate um, space and time. So if you occupy, occupy no space, you also occupy no time. Okay, so how much space does your soul occupy or your spirit? None, right? Therefore, it occupies no time and it's timeless. So to be absent from your body, your body is the only thing that is trapped in time. Once you're absent from your body, you're present with the Lord. You're, you're not waiting for anything. You're, you are now in, exist in timelessness. So that is why when, you, when, when you're absent from your body, you're present with the Lord because you no longer have to wait for all the end time things. You don't have to do any of that. You're already there. You're already in the past. You're already in the future. You, you, you don't have to deal with that, that time constraint anymore. So, yes, eventually, you know, you'll get your body, but you're not waiting for it. You're going to get it at the, at the same time because 
the only only this world is waiting right so we're we personally we are trapped in a in a in a um 3d or 4d um, for, you know dimension right now but our soul and spirit aren't they will exist eternally they have and, and it it will you know forevermore and so the minute that we don't occupy a space that requires us to be tick tocking along with with this physical body we'll be present with the lord and uh, forevermore right so i, I think that it, it answers the question the body stays here the rest of you goes to be immediately immediately with the lord and, and, and obviously i'm just making it interactive right i'm not trying to ask any difficult questions but um but then it goes back to when we get raptured we believe in a rapture right <laughs> when when we get raptured so would the dead in christ be raptured up too right up all together right so the dead in christ first and then we which are alive but that's the second coming of jesus christ different from the rapture no well, no, it, 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 the rapture is, you know, the dead in Christ, Christ shall rise. That's in um, First Cor right. Corinthians uh, chapter 4. We just read it er earlier. Um, um, it'll be snatched up, the harpasso. That's, that's, that's the rapture. That's not Jesus' second coming. We're, we meet Jesus in the clouds at that point. Um, I think the dead in Christ rising first, you could read that two different ways. Uh, you could read that that the dead in Christ have already risen, yeah. uh, you know, and it, it, and uh, that they'll get the, maybe they'll get their bodies then, but you could also read it that, that that's when they are are are, are called up, uh, like all of them. But then where are they sitting in the meantime? I I think personally I I think that it's just the dead in Christ have already risen to be with you know, and then at the at the rapture. The rest of us are called up. You know, we we no longer have to occupy this physical body. We get a glorified body. Yeah. Is that right? right. Yeah. Uh, one one quick question. So you said that dead in Christ first that time um, we will get the body, or it's a physical body as it is here. At some point, we get a f a new physical body. Glorified yeah, body. a glorified body. So that the um, uh, rapture time. I mean, dead in Christ first, and then the uh, remaining the people who are living here caught up in the cloud. That's a, that's the way the we we taught the rapture, right? So, so that I mean, I was just confused. You know, I just want to make sure. You know that you know you said you know uh, when you die, your soul and spirit be with uh, God. So there is no time because I I agreed with that your principle. I agree totally agree. But that time the the soul and spirit is with God. Then why the dead in Christ first? There is, um, that's because they've already been separated from their body. Mm -hmm. So the so body was the resurrection that time. What I'm saying is, is, is it's not necessarily that the dead in Christ are going to going to wait until the trumpet blows. The dead in Christ shall rise first, meaning that's already happened, and now the rest of us go up. That that's a that's one way to read that that kind of makes a little bit more sense when you, when you realize that to be absent from the body oh, is to be present with the Lord. And I don't believe that your body is, 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 you know, I don't think that your spirit and soul are sitting there with your body waiting for, for that trumpet. I think that the minute that, the minute that your body perishes and sleeps, that you are now with the Lord. So when, it, when you read, you know, uh, the, the dead in Christ shall rise first, I think that they shall rise as soon as, as, soon as they die. You know, uh, that, I mean, that's my take on it. It could be, it could be wrong, but it, it, that's the, just the way I'm reading it. No, I was just going to say, you do realize there are two resurrections, right? Well, I think there's more than two. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> yeah. but you want to clarify sure, that? Yes. All right, Revelations 20, uh, 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God in which had not worshipped the beast. Neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. 
So you do have the you do have those the first resurrection with those beheaded that did not follow the beast that reigned with, with God for a thousand years. Then it talks about the second resurrection. Which leads us to another question because perhaps we'll go. <laughs> maybe we won't. Maybe won't go in order. Maybe we'll do a different thing. Maybe we'll make it the last one about about um, just regarding its actual timing. Is there any hope for those who missed the rapture? Can I go first? Yes, it's I, th so I think so, because <laughs> you've already started. Go for it. Uh, this is just a short answer. Yes, if you are breathing and you are alive, you have the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The thief was, what, minutes from death. So you're right, disregarding when the rapture is, putting that all aside, if you are living and breathing, you have the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And that goes in, sorry, goes into the pre-tribulation tribulation view of I want to I want to <laughs> I want to push back against that a little bit. What about if somebody does and this is going to lead into the other question you have on your list. What if somebody takes the mark? Now that uh, uh, we know that Christians can't take the mark. I'm, I'm not asking that. What if after the rapture, okay? Rapture happens, the we have the the antichrist roaming the earth, we have all this nonsense going on and Somebody breaks down and takes the, and the mark and worships the beast. At that point, they're still breathing. I think scripture makes it clear that they, they are unsavable at that point. Do you, do, you, do you have anything that you can point out differently on that? Which is basically it what you said in terms of. Right, but that, that was those who were beheaded. Beheaded because they were pagan. Right. Um, I the only way to make it from here would be But then remember, you can't buy or sell anything without the mark right, of the beast. Right, right, without taking the mark of the beast. It would have to be more of a physical... Yeah, you have to shed your blood. blood. Right. So the if you take the mark of the beast, I don't think you're going to be saved, not because you took the mark of the beast, but because of you know what God says, if you take the mark of the beast, you're following the Antichrist. So... I don't, I, I mean, I'm not here to judge anybody or condemn whether or not, and I know the other question kind of got into some of this of God knows your heart. Yeah. Yeah. And if you take the mark of the beast, you're probably anti-Christ, which means you're not going to be saved. So it's not that you don't have an opportunity to get saved because you took the mark of the beast. You took the mark of the beast because you don't believe in Christ. Right, I, th I think that there's scripture that backs that up where in uh, Romans chapter one, where it talks about, you know, God gives them over to their de to their deceptions, you know, and uh, you know that's talking about you know probably prior to, but I think that it shows that God will eventually, if you push hard enough against Him, He will let He will let you go and and, and He will allow you to be turned over to your deceptions, and I, I think at that point you can't ever come back from that. Yeah, but it's a. I don't think you're pushing against God. I think you're just walking away. I'm just taking the mark of the beast because, like Jesse said, you know, I'm hungry. I gotta, I got food. I gotta buy. And you know, somebody talked about Jesus a while back, but I, I don't know who this Jesus is. But I can't feed my family without taking the mark of the beast, which is why Christians need to pay attention to what that mark is. But I think if you take it, it's not that you're pushing against God. I think you're just. I mean, you're just, you're on the wide road to damnation. I mean, it's, it, it isn't my decision. I, it's not God's decision. As an individual, we're all responsible for making that decision. So if you've taken the mark of the beast, you've pretty much already made that decision. Yeah, I was going to go back to Romans chapter 1 again on that. Because um, it talks about how everybody knows God, that there's a God. Every, everybody, you know, it, 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 there's ample evidence yeah, and I'm totally paraphrasing here, but that's fine. Um, and it talks about how it's blatantly obvious that there's a God and, and, that, and that we all know him and that if we aren't accepting him, we are actively rejecting him. So I, I would say that, you know, yes, they might make excuses. Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, I, oh, I, I didn't get enough understanding. But realistically, they're, they're actively pushing against God in, in, in that. I, I, I don't think that anybody's going to be able to say, at the at the judgment seat that well I was just hungry and I didn't know any better they knew better I think I think the well, that that God has laid out the case fa fairly well that everybody knows better that's true but you have 
but we not, we're not even in end times. So we don't have the mark of the beast, and yet you have, you know, the road is wide. I mean, you've got millions and millions of people that have turned from Christ. They don't have the mark of the beast. They're still going to be held accountable. And so whether or not you have the mark of the beast, God knows our heart. And if we accept Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior, then we're marked for Jesus. But I think there's just too many people in this world that, you know, I had a friend that was atheist, actually two of them that I spent a lot of time talking with, and it was, I said, all right, what happens when you die? He says, well, we just cease to exist. And that was, that was harsh. And the other one, I, I carpooled every day for a year, hour there, hour back, and we always had these conversations. And he's like, why do you believe? I t- you know, it came to, I have a, gar- a, a God-shaped hole, and it's the only thing that's going to fill that is God. And there are people that have it. They recognize God, but they fill it with something else. And that's where it's fleeting. It's they, they fill this with this other stuff and well, they end up away I just from wanted God. to share that quote uh, in Romans chapter one and verse twenty four that Scott was talking about. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. 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 Which leads us into what is and what isn't the mark of the beast. Some people even are saying right now that 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 you can take a mark of the beast. That it's that it's here now. And so I mean this is a timely question and I really really appreciate whoever asked that because I think um, as we get ready to close this discussion I think there's two very important questions and we'll try to get both of them in. Number one, what is and isn't the mark of the beast? And I think the last one that we're going to talk about tonight, um, if, unless we want to say past eight. No, I think we're probably going to talk about this one next week. Okay. Then the last one is, um, which I really appreciate the audience al- already dialoguing. So, um, you know, we, we're going to have to close, but, it, but we have a lot of good stuff for the next one. So, um, But the last one is, can you lose your salvation? So these two are very timely and very important. Um, So what is and isn't the mark of the beast? Are we already there? Uh, Okay, so the mark of the beast growing up, the mark of the beast used to be the barcode. Everybody remember when the barcodes came out? Oh, it's the mark of the beast. They have these, you know, you can get your dog implanted with those chips. Yeah, this is the mark of the beast. Uh, Credit cards before that. As a Christian, you'll know what the mark of the beast is, okay? It's, you know, it resembles 666, you know, he can, he can hear, you know, 666. I don't, I don't know if it's going to be 666 stamped on your forehead. I don't know what it is. But as a Christian, you'll know what it is. Now, once saved, always saved. Okay, I have to ask you. Are you asking for yourself or are you asking for somebody else? And you have to think about this and put yourself in that perspective. If I'm asking for myself, only God knows my heart. I know my heart and God knows my heart. Because Jesus says that are those who cry, Lord, Lord, will not be saved. So there's obviously people in the world that will cry, Lord, Lord, and not be saved. It's in the Bible. So if I'm asking for somebody else, you know, you cast out spirits and perform miracles in Jesus' name. And yet Jesus says, I know you not. Away from me. So there are people in the world that can talk a good talk, walk a good walk, that ain't going to heaven. So if you're asking for somebody else, well, Bobby was saved 10 years ago. Okay, first of all, you are not the judge. You are not the condemner, okay? That is between, you know, who would I say, Bobby or John or whatever, and God. I can show that. I can talk to them and tell them about the Bible, but at the end of the day, it comes down to individualism. It's my choice. They have to make an individual choice. And I understand that people have family members that, Billy was saved 20 years ago back when he was sixth grade, but he's gone astray and, you know, once saved, always saved. That's, as a parent, that's hard. I understand that. But also have to realize that it's his responsibility, that individual's responsibility to be saved. So once saved, always saved applies to you. It doesn't, you know, it's in your heart. It doesn't apply to, because you, you don't know the other person's heart. Only God does. <laughs> we're gonna go down a different. Yeah. We're gonna go down a different road. Well, so I'm gonna. Yeah. Quick comment that um, we're talking about the mark of the beast, what 
great decision from RV Dare. Now, uh, I know that uh, Jerry said it kind of leads us to believe that there's clearly more to this. Number one, we have more than just a supply of bottles. Um, the bottle shortage we're going to have you can't buy or sell in the village unless it's perfect. But there's another criteria, right? I know uh, Ken uh, Ted Scott and I were talking about this. The other criteria is the W word, worship, right? Yeah, I mean, you have to worship the beast in order to receive the mark. Um, I know that there are people that will quote uh, Revelation 18 or something like that where, where it talks about how people are deceived by, by sorcery and the word for sorcery is pharmakia. But it, you know, and so they're like, oh, so you could be deceived into taking the mark because of drugs. And I'm sorry, it's, it's a stretch. It's, it, it's like a, it's taking words out of context in, or in order to fulfill it. But, you know, the, it clearly says that those who take the mark and worship the beast. And so taking the mark, it, 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 you know, taking a, a seal, you're sealed into worshiping a, you know, a, a, a false, you know, deity. Um, there's also, it also talks about we get a mark as Christians. We're, we're sealed in Christ, right? Um, and so it... <laughs> We may, it may not even be a physical thing that you can see. It, it may just be talking about y your works or your thoughts have sealed you because of your, because of your worship to the beast, you know. And that's why it says a hand, your hand or your forehead. It, it may not be a a brand or a or a, or anything that you can externally see. I mean, Cain was marked. Well, but uh, how does it does it tell you how? No, it doesn't say. Um, he had a mark, and it, and it was a protection from God so that people wouldn't kill him. What was the mark? We don't know. I, I just want to piggyback on what Scott said, which, you know, we try to tell the kids about being deceived. God says we will be deceived. People will try to deceive us. It's, and Faye, um, Faye Dunaway, when she was preaching, she said it's the Antichrist. It's not the anti-God. Satan comes to deceive. He will deceive lots and lots of people. That's why you have to have read your Bible, have your, your faith up, because you don't want to be that person that's deceived. Paul talks about the great falling away. You know, brother fighting against brother. There will be, unfortunately, there will be Christians that are going to be deceived. I think that's going to be... We want to save a, no, a lot of time for that one because I got some scriptures lined up here. We want to give that to start one. with the next it's time. It's yeah, definitely, yeah. because I, I think that's a much longer. I would have just okay. kind of tabled that one for next time because okay. we, we could probably take up an, an entire half a discussion on that oh, one. There you go. Yeah. And maybe that's I, a good, I vote a good this thing to think about. discussion start at, uh, right after church then. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's a good bring thought. Yeah, so man, so bring some lunch. Discussion, you know. We, we talked a little bit about eschatology in the first one, about en the end times. And so now I, I think to spend a lot of time on and to really help equip everyone that, that's hearing us and that's here to witness to other people about, okay, well, I'm saved. Can I lose it? It's very important to, um, to come and uh, take notes on that or be on live stream and take notes for our next discussion. And we'll let you all know when that is. Well, I want to thank everybody joining us on live stream tonight. Thank you so much for your participation. I want to thank our lovely audience tonight. God bless you all for coming out on Sunday night. And uh, you're already here with us on Sunday and you're here Sunday night. Uh, God bless you for that and all the great audience participation. And uh, let's have a big, a warm hand for our panel tonight. Thank you, Pastor Jerry, um, of course, Pastor Kenwin, pa and Brother Scott, and Sister Rachel. Didn't know Rachel was a preacher. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're s we're seeing everybody's spiritual gifts a little bit tonight, aren't we? Thank you all. It was great. Uh, Pastor Jerry, um, I, I know we're getting somebody uh, shooting a picture with us, but um, Pastor Jerry, would you like to close everybody in sure. prayer? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that the most important thing is that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins, that we were born with sin, and that the most important thing is that you sent your son and that we accept him as our Lord and Savior to be with you again one day, God. And we just ask that 
sometimes we get distracted by questions. We always want to know the answers, the deep answers. We want to know more, but we just ask that you give us peace, Lord, that we know that you are the God of the universe and that you sent your son to die for us and you sent the Holy Spirit as a helper, Lord. So we just pray that everybody read the word of God, Lord. Put your nose in the Bible. Read it so that we won't be deceived. So when that time comes, when they say, Here he is, the Messiah is over here, that we will not be deceived, Lord. We just ask you to give us faith and strength and wisdom and knowledge, Lord, in the end times. And Lord, we just pray that keep everybody safe here. We just ask you to help us all to be, most importantly, the lights unto the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.